Um, Maureen, uh, good morning, Maureen. Dr. Maureen Sire from Interface Scotland, the Director of Interface Scotland. As good morning. As co-chair of the Religious Diversity Centre in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I'm so thrilled to be able to speak with you at this very, very important end of this very important and crucial conference that you've been so much a part of. And I do thank you for, as Interface Scotland, keeping the Religious Diversity Centre in touch with all that you've been doing. It's just been so exciting and it's helped us become part of this movement of the interfaith people around, around the climate change issues. And Morena Rod, good morning to you. I hope uh, you're not too exhausted, but as a New Zealand journalist, I know you've been frightfully busy over the last two weeks, and our Religious Diversity Centre advisory group was absolutely so pleased to have you, our man in Glasgow, reporting back to us. <laughs> and we're looking well, back to having you, we're looking forward to having you back later and talking face to face. But in the meantime, it's just lovely. So thank you both at the last morning of this conference for giving us your time. It's so good of you. Well, first of all, I'd quite like to ask each of you if there is something that stands out for you from the past two weeks of the conference, something you won't easily forget, something, it might be a conversation, might be a speaker, it might be an event that will stay with you over the next, the rest of your lives probably, um, but something to share with us an aspect of this crucial conference for the whole world. Maureen, would you like to, to, to say something there? Gosh, there's so many moments um, that I can think of throughout this, this last couple of weeks that have touched my heart deeply from our prayer and meditation vigil with religious leaders from across Scotland and, and hundreds in, in the public square with us praying and, and online and, you know, um, live streaming as well. That was such a cosmic moment, you know, I just... I actually genuinely felt that everyone was there praying for a successful outcome of COP. And even within the vigil, there was a moment after the reading of the Glasgow Multi-Faith Declaration and the prayers that we had a minute's silence. Mm -hmm. And actually the whole square was silent. And just towards the end of, the, of that moment, that minute's silence, a flock of birds just flew up and it was as if nature was saying thank you for those prayers it was just honestly it was so beautiful but um another kind of um and, and it's from your part of the world really this week i met um with Mina talia from the island of tuvalu he's there with the, the climate network from tuvalu and we went out for dinner and he presented me with this beautiful scarf it's a hand knitted scarf and it's from something, oh, you can have, yeah, you can see it there. Yeah. Um, and it, it goes from blues to reds. So the blues are the, how we should be and the reds are where we're heading. <clears throat> and it was knitted by um, indigenous people and an um, organization called Common Grace. And he presented the scar and we mm. had dinner together. And during, during the dinner, he showed me a video, just a short video clip. Of, of Tuvalu and the houses along the shore and then the ocean literally pouring in through the house and right across a football pitch. And he said, wasn't a storm surge, wasn't a tsunami, this is what's happening to our island. And, and just I just felt so deeply moved to be sitting with someone, as you all probably know, I, I lived in Samoa, so I, and yeah. and I didn't realize that, that it was the Samoans that that traveled to Tuvalu to introduce Christianity to Tuvalu. So we could have a little bit of a conversation in my very broken Samoan, but it was fun to do that. And and there was just something about I don't know the interconnectedness of our world and the beauty of Indigenous people doing something so lovely, you know, like knitting a scarf and presenting it, and um, it just felt meaningful and, and 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 beautiful, but also poignant and sad because I'm I'm recognizing that here we are sitting in Scotland and this whole 
um, COP26 is going on and there are other people in the world where it's not like some projected future, it's happening right now mm -hmm. to them, the impact of the climate. And even though I've known that, because you hear it and you read it and you, you, you know, you're always talking about these kind of things, but to be sitting with someone who could show me physically on his phone the, the ocean sweeping across their home. Um, mm. it, it, it just, it, it, it was just, I don't know, just moving. I, I think that probably the vigil and, and, and being with uh, Maina, uh, you know, Indigenous Pacific Islander, those perhaps were two very cosmic moments for me among, among so many, I have to say. Yeah, thank you thank you Maureen you've brought the world you've brought Glasgow to us in the Pacific in that way mm -hmm. it's beautiful thank you Rod what have you got a moment that you would like to share with us yeah thank you Kira um Jocelyn and uh, Maureen it's lovely to go online with you so Atamarie the um I wanted to say two things very briefly one is that what I feel is the spirit of COP um it's not necessarily the dominant spirit but it's the uh, the best of COP because there's obviously dark forces here as well um but so many people I've met seem to me to have this extraordinary blend of three um characteristics first of all they're cold-eyed and utterly realistic about um how grave the danger is how short the time we have to work on this Secondly, they're immensely creative um, about what the solutions are, and they're unrelentingly positive about that, despite all the um, pushbacks and everything else. I'm sure they'd have their moments too when they despair, um, but um, the, the, here they're, they're, they are really into the whole thing. But thirdly, they have this huge willingness to work with others and find others to cooperate with. And very wonderfully, I heard from um, one of uh, our young New Zealand delegates here, who is involved very much in the heart of things, is that she's finding young people like that on official government delegations. Good. So, of course, it's the older senior people who make all the decisions, but it's these younger people uh, who are obviously in government um, because they're sitting at the negotiating table who are um, trying to work around and overcome all these entrenched position of their elders actually in the negotiating room. So to me, that's, um, if you like, the, the spirit of COP26, of Glasgow. Um, and one particular moment, though, um, on uh, the second day of COP, on the Monday, I was going through one of the pavilions and I found the Turkish pavilion and there was a very interesting display, all the choices we can make. And, and this person, um, Ozga Ozgan, um, as a Turkish artist, um, was inviting people to take a strand of material off a big, from a big roll, just pull the strand, colour coded by which part of the world you're from, and just hook it around the nails as to which you think your priorities are. And his, he, he's, he's a string artist, um, and his, he was explaining to me that um, by the end of COP, he'd have this extraordinary huge string artwork of colour, all these colours from around the world woven together. And I went back to see him the other day and it was looking absolutely spectacular. Uh, and uh, I must admit, I gave him, and why, why am I missing it? I gave him a little uh, Tina Rangatira um, um, Maori uh, flag, um, just as, which I've been handing out one or two to very special people I've been meeting along the way. <laughs> and, um, and so Oscar, um, to me was wonderful because it was bringing art to this, which we need, but in a very practical way. He was helping people give expression to what they know they want to do and are doing. And um, so um, many, many wonderful people, but I have a particular fondness for Osgur Oskan from Istanbul. Oh, that's great. I hope you got yes. a photograph. Have you seen I it do. too, Maureen? Have you seen it? I too? haven't because actually Rod and I are in kind of two different spaces, really, aren't we, Rod? Rod's very yeah. much in the blue yeah. zone at the heart of where all the negotiations are taking place. And Interface Scotland made a very definite decision to be out in, in mm. civil society, if you like, you know, like kind of uh, trying to create spaces and platforms where where you know, faith communities who are not in the blue zone, because there will be those in the blue zone too, are, are getting a chance to really express their love for the planet, love for each other, their willingness to be advocates for change and for transformation. And um, 
and to have their voices heard. So mm. we've been in different spaces, but we have crossed. We had a wonderful yeah. um, hour with um, Bill McKibben, the environmentalist from um, the USA at Glasgow University, where actually Rod interviewed him and you did, it was a really, really interesting um, interview, Rod, thank you. And I was able to give the vote of thanks. So we were we were kind of together in a in a space, and there has been a lot of these kind of liminal spaces, hasn't there? You know, where yeah. the, the people from the blue zone and civil society and and activists from around the world have kind of come together, and there's been uh, moments, you know, where mm -hmm. where um, it's been really nice. That was another lovely lovely moment. You know, yeah. just did, did you enjoy doing that interview, um, Rod? Did you enjoy the interview with him? Tell us a wee bit about it. Uh, yes, I will. Um, of course, uh, McKibben is an incredibly important figure. Um, his first book in 1989, The End of Nature, um, is was an amazingly early and prescient and powerful prophecy about what was going on based on the science. And then um, he uh, led the fossil fuel divestment movement because like the anti-apartheid movement, that was very much led by faith groups and uh, universities, uh, particularly students initially and then later university endowments. And I have a very vivid memory of him coming to New Zealand in um, 2013, uh, when we were starting work on the fossil fuel divestment um, activity in our church in Aotearoa and the Pacific. And um, I, I, as I said to Bill, uh, uh, as we were speaking, I said, every time I go past that same um, lecture room, in the basement of the OGG building at University of Auckland, I metaphorically give a little hat tip to Bill as I go past. And, um, but, but crucially, there was a third person in that conversation because um, that was um, the very wonderful uh, chaplain of Glasgow University, uh, who is a Kiwi and not long here uh, with her husband, who's in the um, uh, teaching in the religions department or yeah, such and yeah. such. Um, and um, so Mark and Carolyn are a fabulous couple. And uh, Carolyn um, was doing the most of the interviewing and I was just kind of, um, it was the journalist in me. I had to pop in an extra question or two oh, along sure. the way. I'm very pleased that you caught up with Carolyn Kelly. That's lovely. Oh, very yes. Fun. Yeah. And yeah. Well, this is so New Zealand because yes. um, Carolyn, I discovered that Carolyn and Mark's son, um, uh, Alex um, worked with us in the diocese of Auckland yes. as a young student um, on these issues yes. and led the fossil fuel divestment movement at the University of Auckland. He now works for Oxfam down in Wellington. Um, yeah. And Alex is one of my favourite people, and it was just so fabulous to meet his parents. It was a very, it was a very New Zealand moment. <laughs> yeah, and it's such a, such um, it just shows the, the interconnectedness of our world now. I mean, how we can ever think that we can, ca you know, carry on with divisions as if we're not all completely interconnected. It just, it's like it was like meeting someone from. I don't know, the town, the town down the road, wasn't it? You know, there's Carl and Kelly, the chaplain, and yourself, no. and Bill McKibben, and I've been to New Zealand, and you, we've met each other, and it was all, you know, and you just think we're, yeah, we're so connected, and um, and I think this very much speaks to the climate crisis, actually, because I think it, it came out during COVID that none of us are safe until all of us are safe, and Thanks. that's the yeah. of who is our, who is our neighbour, you know, and the Pacific Islands are our neighbours, you're our neighbours, you know, we're neighbours with China, USA, we're all, we're neighbours, we live in a neighbourhood now, and did I think, you, uh, I think um, Rod, uh, Rod, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I did just very briefly, if I may, uh, the number of delegates kept rising, so we got to mm. pretty much 40,000 delegates, uh, which is the largest COP ever, uh, bigger than Paris, and of course uh, we are kind of a self-selecting group, uh, but I still think uh, very representative in many ways, uh, particularly the uh, voice from society through NGOs, and in those events outside the blue zone and, and the green zone, the green zone is more um, exhibition and stuff with public access, regulated public access, uh, but then ar around the city, amazing programs. And so the phrase, um, I obviously hardly a, an original one, I've been using a lot about this being a hui of humanity, um, because <laughs> uh, it really was that kind of gathering of the clans, if I may, mixed by cultures. And um, 
you, I really felt that the COP campus was a village. Uh, once you got through security, it was about a brisk 15 minute walk from one end to the other. Um, and so that is a village and the main thoroughfare through it, there was a very, there were lots of intersections, but the main intersection literally had the plan, uh, the plenary set rooms one way, the largest being Cairn Gorm, named after the highest peak in Scotland, 4,406 feet, as I remember correctly from my childhood, uh, jaunts up it um, and then um, negotiating rooms the other way and then on the main thoroughfare it was um, uh, civil society back this way and um, country offices and the media center the other way so sitting at that intersection um, between those two major thoroughfares and seeing all these people go by that was the village square it, it, it really was it sounds wonderful it, it still is it's going on for at least another day if not another, another couple <laughs> Can, yeah. Maureen, can I ask you now, because yeah. I know that you have, with Interfaith Scotland, built a programme for the whole year, bringing the climate change crisis in a real, a real way to people. You've, mm -hmm. you've built your programme all year, and now you have seen the interfaith groups and the religious communities come together around COP26, around this concern. How have you found that? And what have you learned? And why is it so important that interfaith groups and religious communities mm -hmm. are there? Has it made a difference? Tell us some more. Oh God! Well, you can always hope that whatever you, you know, whatever you do in this area makes a difference. So God, God willing, I mean that is the honest thing to say. God willing, it's made a difference. Yeah, we decided we'd make this our year of climate action, and so we held. You know, all our dialogues really were around um, issues related to the climate crisis. We did a series, a monthly series called the Beyond series, um, and it was the climate crisis beyond. So we did. The climate crisis beyond politics and we invited politicians and religious leaders so we always had a panel of three from different faith communities address that particular topic so they had the climate crisis beyond politics the climate crisis beyond religion the climate crisis beyond science the climate crisis beyond um, economics the climate crisis beyond borders the climate crisis beyond the next generation you get the picture but we always introduced it to say that this is what we were doing to show that the climate crisis was beyond anything humanity had ever faced, really. And that it's only when we work together across all these different facets of human life, of human interaction, can we hope to begin to make a difference. Um, and some of them, some of those beyond that beyond series was at, at really utterly moving. I mean, we had Ambassador de Broome, for example, come and talk about the Marshall Islands. Um, and because, and she spoke during um, Scottish Refugee Week, because um, the way I, I'd link that was to say, really the first, if you like, not quite climate refugees, but environmental refugees were the people of the Marshall Islands because of the nuclear bombing there. And they, you know, they ended up being refugees from their islands and, um, and you know, terrible uh, things. And she, but she spoke about, um, about that a little, but then she really did speak about how they were having to make decisions about which islands to save and which islands to allow to save, you know, um, and movements of people, and it was it was it was beautiful. And you can see them on our, I think they're on our Facebook or YouTube. Channel, they were lovely. And, and what, um, about, what about during, what about during the conference? During oh, well, the conference, you said you had a farewell last night for people from around, was it from around the world? Tell us a wee bit. You know, you've lost voice, you've lost sound. Okay, I'm back again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, during COP, I, I don't know if you know that we also, we made our Scottish Interfaith Week coincide with COP26. So Scottish Interfaith Week is, our, is a big annual festival where we encourage faith communities and interfaith groups across Scotland to do activities around the theme. And of course, the theme this year was Together for the Planet. So actually, the vigil in George Square was also the launch of Scottish Interfaith Week, as well as the first day of COP. Mm. So, mm. yeah, we've, we've encouraged um, communities across the length and breadth of Scotland to hold events during, during this time, which they have. And we've had the vigil, we've had about, you know, we've held our own events during this time as well. 
um, and and then supported other events. So that actually last night the event was held by the Brahma Kumaras community, um, and they they've had quite a lot to do with the hosting of the Talanoa dialogue, um, mm. which was which was really wonderful. And I mean, you'll know because you're from the Pacific that that has come. Um, directly from when Fiji held the presidency of COP, um, mm. and they introduced the idea of the the type of consultation that island communities have, and it was the so the Talanoa dialogue, although it was introduced to COP, I don't think it continued in the the COP space, but they no. continued no. with having this Talanoa dialogue where they brought together international um, representatives from all over the world together for it's really a, a creative space a dialogue space there was an interfaith service we had food together and and our interfaith scotland was on the international interfaith liaison committee to the un triple c for the last year we've done lots of events with them and this was one of the culmination of the events this was our in-person event and it was held in the, the jewish synagogue in garnet hill which was so lovely you know i think traditionally it's been held in churches um and of course, all the churches were used up during COP because they've been great spaces for people to come to. And um, so the Garnet Hill Synagogue offered the space. And I'm sure it's the first time that the, the Talanoa dialogue has been in a synagogue. And it was beautiful. And actually, the chief rabbi came. The chief rabbi of the UK came and spoke very, very beautifully. Um, and um, you probably know Reverend Bagwan from the, the Pacific, from Fiji. He spoke very movingly and along with others. and. You know the workshops were all on the, <clears throat> the key issues that need address. I was in the um, in a, a, a co-hosting a workshop. I felt a little bit embarrassed to be co-hosting it because it was on indigenous wisdom, <laughs> and, and I think they put me there because I'd been in the Pacific and and a, and picked up rubbed, a little bit of the indigenous wisdom had rubbed off on me. But but I was co-hosting it with a beautiful woman from um, the Sami community. Um, so she's an indigenous young woman from the Sami community. Mary is her name and she her wisdom you know it was lovely to be in a space where that was shared but that was just one of the workshops so and um, the Talanoa dialogue so yeah there, there we have been creating so many spaces and we've had a an interface working group for a whole year the Glasgow interface working group that we co-hosted with interface Glasgow and interface Scotland they act as secretary that we've acted as the chair and we've brought the faith communities together to hear what each other are doing but also look at how they can support each other in the different activities that they're doing. So it has felt very, very much like um, a multi-faith, interfaith space um, in civil society, very, very much so, you know, the, from the march to the vigil to so many things. Has this confirmed you in your feeling that we are as interfaith, as religious people, we are part of the world and we have something to say when there's a crisis or when there is, you know, mm -hmm. something happening around us. Would you like to say yeah. something to that? You know, Jocelyn, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've known it and it has confirmed it. And even if you think of the climate crisis, one of the things I've been saying, in fact, I give a, a presentation to the Sisters of Zion, of Zion in London, online, of course, and I said, I wanted to call it the climate, dot, dot, a spiritual and moral crisis, because yeah. actually, actually, the climate's not in crisis at all. It doesn't care. It doesn't wake up in the morning and think I'm going to be very windy or wet today. It just does what it does. The crisis we're facing is our crisis, mm. and it is a spiritual and a moral crisis, right at its very heart and soul it is, because it's only when we change, when our, our, our inner life and the way that we live on the planet changes, that the climate's mm -hmm. going to come out of its crisis, the crisis that it doesn't even know it has, because it's not, it's not a conscious that's, thing. That's it's our that's crisis. Fun. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. And it takes me to my question for Rod. I mean, how are we going to get this transformation happening in our own lives, in our own communities, in our own nations? Rod, you see the civil society is having a part to play in bringing pressure on the government to bring about change. Would, yes, you, like speak, would you like to speak to that now? Yes, absolutely. The political process, of course, is very fraught and very difficult, both within every country and between countries. So what happens, though, in the world, I say this as a business journalist, is money moves far faster than politics. 
with the caveat that politics is dysfunctional and moves very slowly until there is some cataclysmic rupture, you know, a revolution or an, an overturning of the existing order. So what we're seeing now is this extraordinary tsunami, I'm sorry to use the term, but it's a deliberate term, uh, this tsunami of money rushing into this climate space to solve all these issues. So, so much of the conversations I've been involved with is about business solving the climate crisis. And I'm going, no, 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 this isn't an economic or a technology problem we're trying to find a solution to. It's a, it's a human one, it's an all of society one. So we don't need a business solution, that, that's a tool, that's one of the tools. Um, it has to be a human solution, a societal one. And I come back to a, 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 a sort of a central thought that underpins everything I do. This overwhelming sense that we won't um, um, do enough about all this until we care enough, and we won't care enough until we reestablish uh, our right relationship uh, with the Earth's living systems, which um, is creation, which is our life support system. And uh, that's the very spiritual journey that uh, we actually need to be on. And, and, and people giving uh, expression to that in the myriad, you know, innumerable ways that humankind does, whether it's through um, the, the big formal great religions of the world and each person having their own um, life in that faith tradition, or whether it's um, just something deeply intrinsic in oneself um, about that sense of relationship. And so um, that to me is the overwhelming thing for me about, not overwhelming, I'm not overwhelmed. This is the dominant thing that's on my mind is that yes, um, business technology, fabulous, doing great things. Um, and wonderful that um, civil society is giving great expression to these things um, at COP and outside COP, um, as we've seen, for example, very powerfully with the interfaith thing. But civil society still doesn't have um, an, um, enough leverage, um, enough impact in the negotiating rooms. So that's why um, post COP, because it's an endless journey, um, in all of our communities, uh, whether it's you know, your neighbors next door to you or your part of your village or your town or your huge city or, or your profession um, and links all around the world is that we just have to um, engage in government uh, very powerfully and show them um, a reasonably united front about what we know needs to happen and what we want to happen, which will then hopefully give um, politicians um, the courage and conviction to overcome vested interests and and the foot draggers and everybody else who is holding us back. And so we need to make sure that uh, politicians are truly um, the servants of society uh, rather than their self-proclaimed role as leaders of society. Um, but it's a role that they are not adequately, they're incapable of um, in, in fulfilling. Even somebody who is a, a person, I think of a great spirit, uh, Barack Obama, struggled mightily as a politician um, to get much happening in the US Congress. So that's why th this is, uh, Maureen is absolutely right, this is a, a human crisis and at the heart a spiritual crisis. And that's um, what we need to get an awful lot better about talking about. One last thought about this, um, October 4th, St. Francis Day, Pope Francis held in the Vatican, uh, a great interfaith dialogue, more than 40 faiths of the world represented. Their final statement, um, I, I do this kind of thing, I, I check words and statements. This, it was a perfectly good um, social democratic um, expression of what needs to happen about caring for each other and equity and all the rest. But those leaders of the world only use the word spirit once and spiritual once um, in that whole um, statement. In comparison, St. Francis Laudati Si in 2015 uh, gave much better expression to that spiritual dimension. And uh, so personally for me, as a business journalist, uh, I just have to be uh, an awful lot um, better at being able to express this very widely rather than to just people in my faith community uh, and others. So uh, that for me is the, the big, personal challenge that I take on as I <clears throat> yeah. get ready to come home from Glasgow. 
you make me think that one of the recommendations that our religious leaders and interfaith groups recommendations to our government was that people expert in the crisis in the climate crisis issues from within the religious communities mm. and from within the indigenous communities experts from within those communities should be part of the discussions at government level if we could only achieve that, but then, of course, that would mean that our religious communities and our interfaith communities will need to be talking about all this and will need to be expressing it in, a, in that kind of depth of spirituality that you are speaking of. I think we've all got something to do in the future. Maureen, would you like to add something there? Yeah, it's interesting because we had we offered our home for homestays. Um, and initially, of course, you contact your own community and say, would, would anyone like to stay? And we've only got a little house, but we squeezed, we managed over the course of two weeks to squeeze four people in at different times. And um, they were all wonderful in their in their own ways. You know, one was a lovely Christian lady from New York that I knew, um, um, Chloe Breyer from the Interfaith Centre of New York. And so we had lots of wonderful interfaith uh, conversations. She's a, um, a minister. Um, and then we had two... Uh, samba players who were part of the Extinction Rebellion uh, samba drumming stuff and and then a wonderful woman called Maya Groff who is in the blue zone is in that space is a is a Baha'i with um who's an international lawyer she works on um tribunals criminal tribunals to take governments to task over corruption and also as chair of the global governance um, committee so the conversations with her sort of help my brain expand and try to understand some of the bigger issues. And she brings into that space, as well as her incredible intellect and experience, her spirit. And, you know, that her, her love for humanity and, you know, all of it. So I think Rod's absolutely right. We have to not be reticent to also express spirit. And I think for too long, there's been this separation of, even science and religion to some degree you know it's as if if you're deeply religious you can't possibly be rational and scientific <laughs> which is nonsense you know what I mean they're just, and, and and so this kind of dichotomous thinking has to go and and become much more integrated and whole and I think people are even if they're not religious as such with whatever that means they, their people are naturally deeply spiritual. Spiritual, and they exactly. know that this is a spiritual so, crisis. So it's building, yeah, it's building connections and talking together and sharing at depths. Thank mm. you, Maureen. And Rod, would you like a last word? I'm looking at the time. Would you like <laughs> to just have a last word and then a last word from Maureen, and then we must finish. <laughs> yes, um, it's. Uh, um, it's just a little bit of advice, if I may, if people are watching this in the next few days. Inevitably, uh, what we, is considered the final document that comes out of COP26 will be very uh, disappointing in many ways. It, it will have fallen short on, on pretty much everything that we need to do. Um, but um, note that, but don't be, uh, don't despair about that. Um, because um, for all the reasons I was just talking about, about how we can move these things on. And I come back with this um, huge sense of excitement, um, having um, spoken with so many wonderful people over these last two weeks about their work and what's going on in the world, um, that I, I know the spirit is moving uh, swiftly and boldly through these people. So we need a tsunami of spirit to match the tsunami of money pouring into this Thank crisis. You. Thank you. And Maureen? I, I actually, I'm going to hold on to that thought, a tsunami of spirit. <laughs> I love it. Um, but a tsunami of action as well. I mean, our, my own Baha'i community released an eco-pledge where people are going to commit to making changes. We have to walk the talk. So I'd say, yes, be advocates for change, but live it as well. You know, really yeah. try to try to live it, you know, so that we are making changes in our lives. We're walking the talk. Um, mm. So a tsunami of spirit. Wow, I love it. <laughs> you too. Uh, can, I, can I just add one caveat? Because I, I, I use the word cautiously because we think of tsunamis being very damaging, which they can yeah. be. 
um, but um, they can come in in slightly more manageable forms. But the <laughs> sense that it is a great wave um, sweeping across the oceans and ultimately having landfall. Um, and yes, it is going to sweep away some things, um, but it doesn't mean destruction and, and total wipeout. It just means um, a great wave of change is how I mean that word, not in a, a particularly dark or negative way. And to finish off, note the wave underneath the Religious Diversity Centre's logo. There's a wave. You've oh, given yes. me something new Beautiful. to you, something new to think about with our logo. So thank you, Rod. Thank you, Maureen. I'm I'm very keen to share this this conversation with others here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So the Religious Diversity Centre does thank you both and um, happy journey, safe journey home, Rod. And Maureen, I hope that you will get some rest in the days to come after such a big year and a big fortnight. Thank you both. Good night. Thank Good you, night. Jocelyn. It's been yeah. lovely. And Rod, lovely to see you both again. Lovely to see you too, Maureen. I'm sorry not to catch up with you one last time in person. It but there will be, be nice. other occasions. Uh, there will be other occasions.